Good afternoon and welcome to the 158th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today we'll talk about COVID-19 and the digital divide with Blair Levin. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 28, 2020, there are 1,170,283 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 8,812,318 cases reported in the United States, up from 8,735,312 reported yesterday, and there are now a total of 227,109 deaths in the United States from COVID-19, that's up from 226,171 reported yesterday, continuing this trend of right around 1,000 deaths a day in the United States. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. This one comes in two parts. First part is an obituary, and the second part is actually a edict from the governor of New York. Headline is Michael Field of Valley Stream, volunteer, firefighter, and EMT by Anthony Reber. This was published May 13th in New York Newsday. It's hard to pinpoint exactly which part of being a 33-year Valley Stream volunteer firefighter and EMT appealed the most to Michael Field. He loved it all, said his son Stephen of Valley Stream. And he did it all. Michael Field served the company as a lieutenant, as a captain, and since 2007 as a warden on the department fire council. He also enjoyed being the head advisor for the Valley Stream Junior Fire Department. Before I became a member of the Valley Stream Fire Department, I went through the ranks of the junior fire department and my father was my advisor, Stephen said. Same thing with my two younger brothers. He just loved being there for the kids. Michael Field died on April 8th at age 59. On March 24th, he responded to a medical emergency in a residence where a patient had a known case of COVID-19 and contracted the virus, according to the U.S. Fire Administration. Giving back was very important to him, said Stacy, his wife of 26 years. He was very family oriented, being all together was very important to him. Field was a New York City Fire Department EMT for 15 years and responded to the September 11 terrorist attacks. He was there when the second plane hit the second tower, Stephen said. He was there for most of the recovery efforts afterward. After retiring in 2002, Field worked for the Valley Stream Highway Department in the Signs Division. Besides his wife, Stacy, and his son, Stephen Fields, also survived by sons Richard and Jason, both of Valley Stream. All three sons are volunteers in the Valley Stream Fire Department. Stephen and Richard are NYC Fire Department EMTs. The burial service was held on April 14th as firefighters, while maintaining social distance, escorted Field and his family to Beth Moses Cemetery in Pine Lawn. Now let me read you an announcement from the governor's office, the New York State governor's office, this announcement, October 3rd. Governor Andrew M. Cuomo on October 3rd signed into law legislation designating a portion of the state highway system in Nassau County as the firefighter EMT Michael J. Field Memorial Bridge. The new law honors Michael J. Field, a member of the Valley Stream Fire Department, EMS since 1987, who passed away at the age of 59 after contracting COVID-19 from a patient he was transporting. Again, according to the governor's statement, prior to his work with the Valley Stream Fire Department, Mr. Field was an emergency medical technician for the New York City Fire Department, where he assisted the emergency response during and in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. The designated portion of the highway encompasses the bridge on Corona Avenue in the town of Hempstead that crosses the Southern State Parkway. 
Michael Field's life was defined by public service and a selfless commitment to helping others. In New York, we'll never forget his sacrifice, Governor Cuomo said. His heroism saved lives and helped New York beat back COVID-19, and the entire family of New York owes him our eternal gratitude and thanks. New York State Department of Transportation Commissioner Marie Teresa Dominguez said, dedicated first responders like Michael Field were on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19 from the beginning, putting themselves at risk to help keep the rest of us safe. The Department of Transportation is honored to be a part of this fitting tribute to Michael, whose commitment and dedication to public service and his community exemplify the best of New York and remind us that we are all in this together. Senator Todd Kaminsky said Michael Field gave his life for our community. And it was my honor to sponsor the bill named the Michael Field Memorial Bridge over the Southern State Parkway at exit 15 in his memory. Thank you to Governor Cuomo for signing my bill, renaming the bridge, helping shine a light on our great first responders and creating a symbol for inspiration of inspiration for generations to come. Assemblywoman Michelle Salajas said, the community of Valley Stream will always be grateful for the service and commitment of firefighter Michael J. Field. And as such, we are proud to honor his memory by memorializing his name on the bridge located at Corona Avenue exit. Michael leaves a legacy of dedication to public service. This plaque will serve as an inspirational reminder for generations to come. May he rest in peace. Okay, let's turn to our discussion for today. Really thrilled to have Blair Levin on today. Let me introduce him. Blair Levin is a non-resident senior fellow with the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. He serves as the executive director of GIGU, the Next Generation Network Innovation Project, an initiative of three dozen leading research university communities seeking to support educational and economic development by accelerating the deployment of next generation networks. Previously, he worked with the Communications and Society Program with the Aspen Institute Communications and Society Program following his departure in 2010 from the Federal Communications Commission, where he oversaw the development of a national broadband plan. Levin served as Chief of Staff to FCC Chairman Reed Hunt from December 1993 to October 1997, and during that period he oversaw, among other matters, the implementation of the 1996 Telecommunications Reform Act, the first spectrum auctions, the development of digital television standards, and the Commission's Internet Initiative. Blair Levin, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'd like to start the way I always do, which is just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is there today. Uh, so I'm in our house in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you know, uh, it's scary, but we live in a neighborhood where people can get out and walk their dogs, and there are a lot new, a lot of new dogs in the neighborhood, um, uh, and stay socially distant, and people do so. It's it's not an urban setting. Um, it's probably one of the more comfortable ones, but nonetheless, the most recent numbers, of course, have everybody more nervous than a few months ago. Absolutely. The, that uptick is everywhere. It's yeah, in yeah, yeah. Maryland, Massachusetts, and, and everywhere. What's the... Except, I guess, the, the Northeast, which is a little bit odd because it's colder up there. But In Maine, yeah. Yeah, Maine and Vermont. And in terms of sort of, um, you're in a state that has divided government. You have a, a Republican governor, but you have a lot of uh, Democratic local governance. Yes. How has the state been working in terms of managing the ideological divides that sometimes other states have been struggling with in this, in this sense? Uh, it, it's complicated, but I think, um, but overall the state's been doing a pretty good job. The, um, on, on kind of in terms of the culture wars, we don't have a, uh, though we have a Republican governor, he is, uh, he, he is not going to engage in the kind of culture wars that some of the other Republican governors have gone into. Um, uh, He's closer to the governor of Massachusetts or the governor of Vermont in, in his nature. So I, I think they've uh, done a reasonably good job. Um, you know, the most important thing is to actually try to do a good job and to try to understand what the truth is. Um, uh, that's not what we've seen from the federal government. Um, but and, and there are certainly some things that Governor Hogan did in Maryland that I think are questionable in terms of a couple of contracts that he entered into to get equipment and things like that. But overall, the state response, I would rate as much higher than the federal response. 
So just reading your professional biography is extraordinary. I mean, you're a person who's been engaged both in the public sector and the private sector with thinking about the internet now yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And I want to just start with a broad question. And as, as we moved into this pandemic in the United States, particularly in March and April when everything is shutting down, you know, we started to see so many cracks in American society. Yes. Inequalities that we know are there, but we don't usually see them all at once. And we began to. Yeah. And I wonder if you could take us back to your thinking, even in those early months of the pandemic, about how how were you expecting to see a digital divide emerge? How were you expecting internet access to be part of what we were seeing with the pandemic in those in those first couple of months? Well, I had a very um, idiosyncratic view of it, as you would expect. Um, in January of this year, before uh, word of the pandemic started to arrive, um, I and a bunch of, uh, so, so in 2009 and, and 2010, me and about 70 other people, along with about 200 people who had full-time jobs or permanent jobs at the FCC, uh, embarked on a project to create a national broadband plan and the fundamental idea of the plan were, was threefold. Number one, get networks everywhere. Number two, get everybody on them. And number three, utilize the networks to better deliver healthcare, education, workforce training, and, and other essential uh, public services. Um, we, we could chat about what we said back in 2010, but that was with the fundamental ideas. Um, it had been 10 years, and we thought... Well, you know, we ought to throw a party because we should all try to get together and and see each other again. And uh, and while we do that, we should have kind of an honest, candid conference in which we say, "Here's what we got right. Here's what we got wrong." And most importantly, here's what the country needs to do to move forward. And one of the primary themes of it was going to come from a part of the plan where we said, "The cost of digital exclusion is large and growing," and the size was actually almost every bit as large, but the price, the, it, it, was, it was, the cost was growing. Anyway, so uh, we scheduled this for mid-March, and of course, we get to March, and we have to cancel it. <laughs> but um, there were far more, th there were many more things that were far more painful than that. But, but the ironic thing was, as we're canceling this, uh, suddenly I start reading editorials everywhere, conservative, liberal, you know, rabbis, priests, Zen Buddhist monks, corporate executives, progressive organizers, all saying, oh my God, we need networks everywhere. We need everybody on them and we need to use them to do a better job of delivering healthcare, education, workforce training. Um, and of course, I'm thinking, where were you people 10 years ago when we needed you right. to push these things? But, <laughs> right. the, but the truth was, um, uh, I understood why we couldn't I mean, we we did, I think, move the ball on some issues 10 years ago. But one of the things we wanted to say and one of the things that became increasingly clear was we really need to finish the job. Uh, we do need to get you cannot have 15 million school children, as we now do, who basically can't. It's not just that they can't do their homework. That's bad enough. They can't attend school. So the cost of digital exclusion is even larger and in growing even faster as a result of COVID. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. And I suppose you you did have the meeting in March, but you did it via Zoom call or some other sort of broadband. No, uh, I you know, people no. forget this, but in early March when everything got canceled, people thought, uh, well, you know, we'll be back in April. Yeah, we'll do it and next so month. And so I thought was that we would, you know, do something live, you know, six weeks later, but I see. Uh, that didn't happen. Well, I hope you're still going to do that that meeting. Uh, I hope I hope so too. I would yeah. love to see all of my former colleagues. It's interesting that you take us back to those um, those three core principles of that plan. Yes, um, which is to make broadband, to make sure we have a national network, to make sure everyone can get on it, and then also um, to I guess, and maybe you could say a little bit more about this to sort of spark the evolution towards broadband usage in areas where it may have been halting in that point. And, I, yeah. and I, I'm thinking right now, particularly around telehealth and around education. Yeah. And so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. I mean, it's, I hear people say we've reached an inflection point. I hear that term a lot. There'll be no going back. I'm in higher education and I can tell you the students do want to come back to campus, yeah. but we yeah. do see 
we've seen now the full proof of concept. We can keep a university running and um, psychiatrists can still work and uh, you know, physicians can still work doing telehealth and doing education. I wonder what you thought about that. And, and do you think we've passed a point now where that third point of your plan back in 2010 has now been realized? Well, first of all, I would say one of the things in, in, in my talk that I actually had already written was that the uh, we talk about the availability gap. That is to say, there are parts of this country where there are no networks. 95% of the conversations when people talk about the digital divide are talking about that gap. Then we talk about the adoption gap. People have access to networks but haven't adopted. There are three times as many people for whom that's the problem. Mm. But most of the discussion... Um, the, the next 5% is about that. I think it should be considerably more. The third gap, nobody talks about, but I actually think when we look back from the perspective of 2030, that will be the biggest gap, and that's the utilization gap. And it's really the gap between mm. what we're doing today and what we could be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will look back and realize, oh my God, there were so many better ways of delivering these things. I would say that in terms of healthcare, there has been an enormously forward, what happened in March was the federal government had adopted a number of rules, which actually we had suggested 10 years ago, that make it easier to utilize telehealth and even more important to be reimbursed for it because that was one of the major problems. Um, and I think this is right. We have gone from a situation in which less than 1% of the visits to, hot, to, to medical professionals occurred over... Uh, a communications network to now it's between 20 and 30 percent and i don't think we're going back and in fact i think it will change the way medicine is delivered there are lots of things for which you don't need to drive somewhere park walk wait for a half an hour you just you know there are lots of things for him you can't do that but um i think we're starting to see a real change uh particularly in medicine for for that Education has not been as successful, particularly at the K through 12. Um, uh, it is hard to convince, you know, second graders to sit in front of the screen, and it's not as good. And there's a really important socialization character. Having said that, however, there are all kinds of things that we're not doing that we really should be doing. Um, you know, for example, I would argue that one of the most important things we need to do as a country on an emergency basis is help um kind of k through uh, fifth graders with reading you know there's always a summer slide where people they're right. they're at their june level and then when they come back to school in september they're back to march well now we're going to have a covid slide where people left in march and now they're back to the you know a year earlier right they lost we, a year. but we can use if we had people online with one-on-one -on -one tutoring which by the way would also employ a lot of people i think we could really help um uh improve you know educational levels and you know an anecdote that i've heard that if it's not exactly true it's it's truish which is sociologists can predict with unerring accuracy the number of prison beds we're going to need in a society based on fourth grade reading schools uh reading um scores 11 years later like you know people who are reading like two levels before their odds of going to prison are considerably greater and and we're going to see that um, next spring in ways that are going to be very scary. So if we want to overcome that, we should use the kind of tools that you and I are using now uh, for different kinds of educational experiences. It, but but that, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of experimentation going on. I hope that the federal government um, actually studies what happened so that we can maybe learn from it and maybe improve performance. Well, let, let's stay with this education point for a second, because you you know you talked about that first sense in which most people think of the digital divide as an access divide. So that's no, I mean, now really there is no excuse, right? I mean, for students who had to be at home and who didn't have access to broadband networks, that is now clearly documented as as stopping the education process. Yes. What's the what's the scope of that? So uh, let's first talk about the availability gap. There are, uh, first of all, we don't know because mm. the FCC, an institution I enjoyed working at and greatly admire, nonetheless has largely failed to give us uh, data. 
Uh, and that's that's not a partisan comment that on a bipartisan basis, Congress has criticized the current FCC for not effectively collecting data. There are some methodological problems. But so there's different estimates, but it's order of magnitude seven to 20 million homes out of 110 million homes um, don't have what you would, what the FCC defines as broadband 25 down, 25 megabits down, three megabits up. You could define it differently and then you'd get a different number, but it's, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the order, order of magnitude. So let's, let's call it 10. Um, there are probably um, uh, 30 million homes, but again, we don't really know the numbers who could adopt, but for different reasons, choose not to. In the past, you might've said relevance was one of the reasons it just wasn't relevant to them. I think for most people now, the relevance is pretty clear, but there's still a, I think the major problem is affordability. There are lots of people in this country who don't, I think 40% of the country does not have discretionary income. A lot of those people are on, but there's a significant number uh, that are not on. And then there's also the issue of digital readiness. Um, the internet actually, for the most part, is a, is a, a, um, a medium that requires some level of literacy. And we already, we have a literacy issue and then we have a digital literacy issue. Um, you know, lots of people don't know how to search for things. Lots of people don't know how to, you know, utilize it in various ways. So there's a, there's a big job to be done to get everybody on. Uh, part of that's generational, but um, nonetheless, if, if kids don't have it in their home, they're not going to do, they're not going to learn as much. So in this sort of a, a emergency situation, how, what kinds of coping have you, have you seen? I mean, it seems to me at this point, you know, some as a student of a public education system, um, everybody in the community pays taxes so that the school is open and the books are available. Um, that student, that sh access to broadband should be entailed in that, right? I, I'm wondering what you're seeing, keeping tabs on this in different parts of the country is how, how yeah. it's been how it's been met. The federal government well, hasn't met it. Yeah, on, on a federal level, um, other than the CARES Act, not much. Yeah. Uh, the Federal That's Communications right. Commission did have for a two month, a pledge, they got a pledge from a bunch of carriers not to kick people off the networks. We could argue about that, but but Congress has not done much, and the FCC has not done much with with arguably greater powers than they've exercised. At the local level, you've seen an enormous amount of experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Chicago has a very large program between the city, the school board, some local philanthropy, um, a lot of nonprofits, where they're trying to connect lots of kids. I've gotten a lot of donations of computers and things. State of Alabama. Uh, has a program that's going to connect 100,000 school kids uh, who aren't currently connected. Um, there's actually a report coming out later this week um, that will document a lot of these different experiments. What I would say is the federal government should be stepping up to solve this problem, both in terms of the emergency, but really the longer term, which is every school kid, you, you, you wouldn't have a school system in which some kids simply were not didn't have the school books. No. Well, if they don't have broadband in their home, that's the equivalent of not having the school books. So the federal government, I think, needs to step up uh, and make sure that all kids in the K through 12 uh, have internet in the home, unless the parent affirmatively, you know, if they can't afford it, there needs to be a subsidy as there is with food stamps or Medicaid. But um, uh, generally speaking, I think that's a federal obligation. So that's an income divide, which is exposed in that in that moment, as you said. The yes. CARES Act, you know, might have met some of that for a short period of time. But well, a lot of the school systems are using CARES Act money to do this. To do that, but yeah. what about the? Um, I know in the in older times there was a, a rural urban um, digital divide. I, I, does that still persist? Is that part of the story here as well? That 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 part of the story is largely the uh, availability gap. That is to say. Uh, in, in urban and suburban and even exurban America, uh, most people have a choice of both a broadband service delivered by their telephone company and one delivered by a cable company. But somewhere between 85 and 95, um, that start, the choices get worse. And then at that, you know, 5%, 5% 5 
from 95 to 100, they have really no choice for broadband as we understand the term. Now, there are some technologies that are coming along. There's something called low earth orbiting satellites. Elon Musk has, has a version of that. And there are some other companies doing that. So that that may solve the problem, but it may not. I mean, new technologies, you never know. And also it may be really expensive and then there may be data caps, we'll see. There's a technology that Microsoft is pushing that involves something called the white spaces, which are kind of um, zones of protection in the spectrum between broadcast channels that can be used without interfering with the broadcast channels to deliver uh, broadband, uh, particularly in rural areas where they don't have that many broadcast television station. So there are some technologies that are coming along to do this. Also, the FCC is will be handing out about $16 billion over the next year to fill in some of these gaps. But the first thing we actually have to do is map where the gaps are. And at this point, we don't have a good map. So just to, you and I had shared a, an email exchange before talking today in, in which you wanted the historian to ask you the history question, which I'm yeah. dying to do, which is, you know, we do have historical analogies here of trying to provide utilities, of yeah. water and sewerage in the 19th century, electricity in the 20th. Are those useful historical analogies here to draw them? What are the, what are the limits to those, um, to those historical uh, trajectories that we see in the past? Yeah, no, I, it, 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 it is absolutely true that, that particularly when you go to the rural question, um, uh, in the United States, there were lots of rural areas that did not have uh, electricity. And the federal government, one of the great initiatives of uh, the New Deal was the rural, electric rural electrification, which was largely done on the local level, but with federal support. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who think that's what we need to do. And indeed, one of the kind of quiet stories of what's going on now is a lot of those rural electric co-ops are actually utilizing their current assets, personnel, you know, telephone poles or electric poles, and they're stringing up broadband and they're going into competition with the telephone companies and the cable companies uh, where, you, where you still have these electric co-ops. Uh, and I think that that's a good model and it, it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you everything. I mean, the thing about electricity is it's kind of binary. You either have it or you don't. And, right. you know, there are some places that go down or not. Whereas broadband is something that's an emerging technology and a different you know, different speeds. When we did the national broadband plan, um, the average download speed was 4.1 megabits. Today, it's about 135. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, you know, there, you could tell the story in different ways. Google Fiber came in and inspired a lot of upgrades and cable wanted to compete. And so they adopted a new generation of technology. And so there are changes um, uh, in the technology. The next one we, we talk about would be 5G wireless, and we'll see what happens with that. And so the co-op model doesn't necessarily work well for a constantly evolving technology. But actually, I think the more the, the most interesting analogy, um, uh, w w there was a, a, a wonderful historic piece called The Computer and the Dynamo. Uh, and it was written in the 90s, and it talked about what was then called Solo's Paradox. Robert Solo was the Nobel Prize winning economist who famously said computers show up everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and, and this essay by a Stanford uh, historian named Paul David tried to examine why that was. And what he talked about was the diffusion gap. And that it took, I think, 40 years for electricity to be in 50% of the factories. Because when el electricity started in the 1870s, Every factory that had been built was built by a river and had a turbine. And you had all these engineers and you know architects who were very comfortable with it and understood it. And it really wasn't until Henry Ford said, I can't build a car with a four-story building with the turbines and the water power. I right. need to go really horizontal. Oh, electricity can do that. Right. And then in the 20 in the 10 years that followed, everybody was doing that. I think we have a diffusion gap in how we, when we were talking about this earlier, how we do healthcare, how we do education. You know, mm -hmm. workforce development, I, one of the great ironies of this, I, I was doing some research into what the federal government was doing to help people who are unemployed. And they have a huge number of programs. 
but they also have 2,400, what are they called, job centers, American job centers, that you could go visit and talk to someone, except for the fact that they're all closed because of COVID. Right. So if you're not online, you don't have access. But that's okay if we had everybody online, right? In other words, right. most people would rather take those job training courses that can be delivered much more efficiently online than going to a center or whatever. So, so um, that's what I mean when I say the utilization gap will look back on and say um, uh, that's where the gap really was. It was between what is and what our imagination could take us to. And that's where I think uh, that piece about the diffusion lag, we're still in the middle of it, though I think COVID is going to accelerate uh, how we get to the other end. I, that's a, it's a, such a powerful idea to apply here. And, and I appreciate you using sort of the contingency of history in that way, because, you know, one of the things, um, you know, we talk about access has been, uh, well, it, as long as, you know, poor folks don't have it in the home, as long as the libraries have it, and there's plenty of terminals in the library, we can still um, provide the internet to everybody as a, almost as part of the municipal social contract. I remember in New York in the early 2000s, that was kind of how it was discussed. The problem is when a pandemic comes, that's not on the table anymore, just as you said with those job training centers. So you, you had to get sort of, that's a fine intermediate step, but that doesn't take you where you need to be in with this moment that we're facing right now. Yeah, no, libraries are really interesting. I, I remember when I was at the FCC, uh, my first stint there, uh, I got there in December of 1993, which conveniently for historical purposes was when Netscape came out. And I remember talking to uh, my boss, the chairman, Reed Hunt, who was much smarter than me about these things. And I kind of said, I wonder what this is about. And he said, this changes everything. And he was right. And one of the things that we thought was, or that I thought was, I wonder if libraries will be around in 10 years. But it turned out libraries started to become very important community Absolutely. hubs. Yeah. Um, and, and, and by, by the way, this goes not just to affordability, but also digital readiness. Libraries are the primary source where people course. who don't know how to use it go and they, they, right. they help people. But of course that gets cut off with the pandemic. Right. Um, and yes, they have a lot of computers and kiosks, but, uh, you know, there are still places where there are half an hour limits and a lot of places. Right. And so if you're like really trying to write a paper or you're, trying to take a class, it's, it's, it's not good enough. So libraries are really important and, and we need to continue them being hubs, uh, but we also need to get in everybody's home. Just remind everybody you're listening to COVID calls. We're talking today about the digital divide and COVID-19 with Blair Levin. This one, I wanna ask you a sort of a sociological question because um, you mentioned this is an interesting statistic of um, people who have access to the internet but haven't don't they maybe they even have it in their home, but they're not using, not utilizing it. And I'm thinking particularly about what we may be seeing around loneliness in the pandemic and seniors, but not yeah. only seniors, um, who, you know, are used to communicating in the ways they always have at the fence, uh, at the post office, uh, at the drugstore, on the telephone. Um, you know, however it may be. And now none of those things, I mean, they may be available now. But yeah. with some trepidation, and as we see the returning of the spike, it's it's hard for people to know right now. I think even in states that are being aggressive, if it's safe or not. So I wonder is this an, is this a real turning point for those who have have not adopted yet, literally to fight the loneliness and the sol the the sort of solitary nature of this disease? Do you, do you expect to see that effect? Yeah. Look, I, I uh, COVID, you know, in in a way was the the single broadest event of certainly my lifetime, and I suspect everybody's lifetime. That is to say, it's the one event that affected everybody. Nobody is living the life they thought they were going to be living yeah. at the, as the year began. Um, uh, and there are lots of different reasons for that. Everybody really is affected. Um, in some ways, it is loneliness is one of the principal things. I think what happens is we start to develop, I mean, in the, in the early months with COVID, there were an infinite number of Zoom cocktail parties and things like that. And, sure. and in some ways, some seniors got to see their grandkids more as we suddenly discovered this thing called Zoom and a thousand variations of it. Um, but it's not the same, right? And so hopefully we'll develop this. I think one of the most fascinating debates 
um, so far has been that debate between Jerry Seinfeld and somebody who I don't know, um, but whose name I've forgotten, but who wrote a long piece in LinkedIn about how New York was finished forever. And the basic idea of it was, if you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to theaters, and you don't really need to go to an office, like why put up with the madness of New York and the high taxes and the dirt and all of that stuff? And, and near the end of the piece, he said, basically, you know, COVID was kind of like the bullet, but the thing that pulled the trigger was bandwidth. It's only because of bandwidth. And by the way, he's, he's certainly right about that. And I, I should have said this earlier, ten, if this had happened 10 years ago, we couldn't be doing all of this because right. the level of bandwidth wasn't enough. But now we can do these things. And then uh, Seinfeld wrote a piece in the New York Times saying, no, New York will come back as it always does. And the reason is because people need to be near people. Well, this is going to be a big debate. And there are, uh, I do some Wall Street advising for institutional investors. And I think one of the big questions is who's right about this, right? Because if Seinfeld's right, now's a great time to be buying commercial real estate sure. in New York. Yeah. But if Seinfeld's wrong, you don't really want to own it, right? And whether it be the hotel business, the convention business, the airline business, there's so many businesses that are affected by that question mm -hmm. of how much do we need to really be uh, in person? And I don't know the answer to that, but mm -hmm. uh, but I think we will think of it always as there was pre-COVID and after COVID. It's to just to come back to the topic we were talking about before, and um, you talk about you know education and thinking about higher education and what's being learned. This is something I'm seeing you know, right in the on the front lines, which is that we've had the capacity to do, I think, quite good remote learning for at least a decade, if not longer, at this yeah. point, um, both teaching students who would not come to the campus, but also teaching students who are on campus who but who may want to take their class in a hybrid format. And we've experimented with very many different things. Yeah. But it seems like there was a missed opportunity. And it was a long time ago. And the missed opportunity was to treat that remote product as a, as a learning product and also be honest that it had limitations so that it wasn't one way or the other, but to do the steps, to do the innovation necessary to come up with this hybridity, which is, I think, where we're going to land. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're talking about with the Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right, though, you know, I think it's going to put a huge amount of stress on a lot of universities yeah. because you can't charge the kind of tuition you're charging yeah. for for remote classes. I I, um, I I just had my 40th law school reunion, uh, and it was a lot of fun. We were all in Zoom together and stuff like that. And it was a relatively small class, and so people knew each other. Um, but you know, thinking about it, the the best part of my law school experience was just these long lunches and meals with really a delightfully smart, funny group of people very different points of view, but but always very thoughtful, interesting conversations. You really had to, you know, bring your A game to lunch, you know? Um, uh, and the people are going to that law school now, they're not getting it. And that was the most valuable part. And I think, and that's not just true of law school. That's true of a lot of different uh, kind of educational experiences. You can't duplicate that online. On the other hand, you can, in a wonderful way, scale up all kinds of training for certain other kinds of um, uh, activities. And I suspect uh, that, that we're going to see a lot more of that in the years to come. So take us back then to the broadband plan when you were working on it. And did you think about disaster? And when you did, what kinds of disruptions did you, did you think about? And did you think about pandemics? We, we actually did. I think we may have been maybe not the only federal government document published in 2010 that had the word pandemic in it. And it was on healthcare. It was basically saying that the kind of ideas that we had about how you stimulate and facilitate utilization of communications networks for telehealth, that which um, uh, would be a good thing generally because it both lowers the cost and improves the outcomes would be an essential thing in, the, in case of a pandemic. Um, but we didn't think about it in the context of education uh, or some of, some of the other ways in which we think about it now. It's, it's interesting that I've, I've thought a lot in these last few months that some of the even earlier lessons from the Cold War somehow seem 
applicable because you know a lot of our disaster preparedness has us thinking about how we're going to mass shelter and how we're going to bring lo- large numbers of people together. Right, right. And a lot of the thinking in the Cold War was how we're going to deal with people who are distributed and have to deal with sort of keeping continuity of business and government and, and life going in smaller nodes. And it seems like we should have continued thinking about that. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. And of course, the internet itself is a product of that thinking. In the early 60s, right. there was thinking about how do we have these redundant networks so that they can't wipe us out, right? right. Um, as, as we got out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, fortunately, without anybody dropping a bomb. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that there that that's an interesting um, tie-in with this, and of course, there's a thought that what this is going to lead to in the you know in the country is that particularly as approximately a third of the country can do work remotely, um, people don't need to live in San Francisco and New York anymore, and and we'll start to repopulate St. Louis and um, you know. Cleveland and, and other places with great municipal infrastructure, but that have essentially been depopulated uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Or will even people will go more rural if you can get the networks out there. So um, you have a great blog post up right now on the Brookings website, and the title is COVID-19 shows that America's broadband plan is still in beta. This was, you published this in May, but I was looking it over and there's a really great line in here I want to get you to reflect on a little bit. You say, you talk about sort of the challenges at that time, a decade later, when we wrote the 2010 plan in an environment which nearly everyone thought of broadband as being largely positive, I'm quoting from your blog post here, while we raised some potential downsides, we largely focused on incentives to do more rather than constraints on negative activities. Any plan written today, you said, would have to reflect on the fact that while the upside of using broadband is greater than ever, those downsides, such as loss of privacy and risks related to cybersecurity, must be addressed. And so let's talk about that a little bit because it has played such a role in our politics, yes. the, the disinformation that's out there. Um, Facebook as an unfortunate source of medical information and many other things that are feeding disinformation into our system. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're getting at here around this, as well as cybersecurity, which is in, entailed in that as well. Yeah. So let me start by saying that my single favorite line in the plan was the beginning of the implementation chapter. And it was written by the youngest person working on our team. And he just wrote, this plan is in beta and always will be. And I, that really was the spirit of the document, that we have to keep updating our thoughts. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate the country hasn't done that. But uh, to the specific point, you know, as, as, we, as you and I are doing this uh, today, the United States Senate had some uh, executives in from some of the big social media platforms. And we're criticizing them. There now appears to be a bipartisan consensus that sec- so-called Section 230, which gives social media platforms, big data platforms, a certain kind of a legal immunity uh, for words that appear on their site, that that needs to be changed in some way. The Democrats and Republicans agree on the need to change, but they don't necessarily agree on why we need to change it. Mm. But But I think the point that you just mentioned that there's an awful lot of damaging and problematic information uh, that, that appears that we have to deal with. And we didn't we weren't thinking about that very well uh, in 2009 and 10. And I think you would think about that now. I hope that when we come out of this and when we start to, as a society, say, instead of just retreating to our immediate partisan positions, why don't we actually learn something? I think if we go back and study what information was disseminated in the course of, the, of uh, this situation, we're actually gonna be quite horrified. Uh, and by the way, particularly for communities of color and particularly for low income communities, there was so much bad information and there's information that literally killed people. I mean, not directly in a way that you can indict them for murder, but in, from, in a statistical way, you, you have various sites and you had various organized campaigns to give people bad information. And as a society, we're going to have to address that too. You, I don't know how, but I think well, that's I, part of the longer term agenda here. Yeah, it's in your sort of discussion about what's what's happening in the Senate. Um, do you 
think? I mean, what's your what's your viewpoint on this in terms of holding social media companies, for example, to greater account for? And there have been a number of steps that have been introduced quite recently by Facebook, for example, or Twitter. You know, this information doesn't seem to be. I mean, they're trying to. There's some warnings there, but I think those who are critical of that say that's not nearly far enough, and that they, you know, this kind of speech, whatever kind of speech, is so long as they can make some advertising revenue on it, they're fine. Yeah. Um, it's a big problem. I, I don't hold myself out as an expert on these issues. I'll, I'll simply note that a, a way of thinking about it is in any system, there's signal and there's noise. That is to say, there are things that are actually meaningful and truthful, and then there's a lot of other stuff. And, you know, what, what certain information systems are designed to do is try to emphasize the signal and reduce the noise. Reducing the noise in this context has a First Amendment issue, right. but I think there are some things that we can do that um, uh, reduce that noise. What I'm wondering about is how do we increase signal? And part of the problem is when you politicize, as frankly the current administration has done, the CDC, and when you say there are no experts, everything is political, science are just, they're just as political as your normal U.S. senator, when you do that, you make it very difficult to provide people signal. So I think as a society, we have to think of both. What are the tags or what are the things that we put on? And look, Twitter and Facebook are struggling with this, you know, in terms of content moderation to try to reduce the noise. But we also have to increase signal. And I would say, you know, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of PBS, which gave us many great things in my opinion, um, including Sesame Street. And the question is, what's what's the PBS equivalent uh, or the NPR equivalent uh, for public health information? That people just know, if you just want the best, um, best practices for what to do in a situation, there is a source. You, you, know, you don't have to rely on what people are trying to bomb you with, but you can right. just go to that source. But I, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. Um, in my experience in, in government, in my two stints in government, it always cracks me up when people say, I did X. And the X are talking about was the actual achievement. In my experience in policy, what I would say I did was I helped move an idea from the 20-yard line to the other team's 30-yard line. You know, somebody else mm -hmm. kicked the field goal or got over the touchdown. But you just you, – you, but but there's a certain amount of kind of grappling with the facts and yeah. you know talking to people and building political capital and eventually trying to get the ball over the finish line. Whether it's you doing it, it's usually somebody who's a senator or president who gets to claim credit for that. But there's a lot that happens before it. And I'm just saying, I would I would look at it from both sides. Yeah. Let's not depend on Facebook and Twitter only. Let's let's build up some public institutions that do it, but let's also make sure that the, the other information that people are getting, at least we tell the story so that people understand that, you know, you just shouldn't trust what you hear on, for example, Fox News. It, I really appreciate that response, and in particular, you're underlining that, that line that you pointed to in the broadband plan that, that, that this will always be beta because there is this, at least... I'm in the opinion box here, but I think in a democracy, and particularly around cutting edge technology in a democracy, this this should be an assumption that there will be robust public debate constantly. Not in that not that you finish the debate, but that it but that it continues. But yeah, right. as you pointed out, we have such entrenched partisan divides right now that it seems hard to find the right venue for that discussion. And I, I say that because you've alluded a couple of times in our discussion today to the need to have some sort of post-disaster uh, reckoning yes. around this. I wonder if you could say a little bit more. That's something I think a lot about too. How, how do you envision that taking place? Can the FCC do that? Does that is that gonna be the private sector um, doing that on its own because there's I too much the money on the sector would, well, I doubt the private sector would do it. I don't, yeah. I don't really understand why what, what their incentive would be. Yeah. The FCC could do it. Uh, I think the FCC, as a matter of jurisdiction, would then be focused on uh, those entities which have FCC licenses, so it would be broadcast 
television and radio, I think that's too narrow. Um, uh, I also think, I mean, if, if I were in charge, I would say, what we're going to try to do is understand how information was disseminated, what information turned out to be really good, what information turned out to be really bad. Um, uh, but not with, the, not with the point of punishing people, not with the point, it should be very clear, we're not pulling anybody's license, but we do need to understand what happened. And I think if you go back, I mean, one of, one of the tremendous ironies to me is that you have a guy who received the American uh, Medal of Freedom, the highest honor they can go to a civ civilian person, Russ Limbaugh, who either he was lying or he was telling people he had medical information he did not have. So when he said it's nothing, you know, back in yeah. February and March. And the thing is, his audience tends to be old. <laughs> yeah. And that's the audience that, you know, was going to be most adversely affected by getting it. You go back and you read some of the things he said. I, I'm I'm sorry, you know, there's blood on his hands, yeah. and yet that guy got an American Medal of Freedom. That's a problem, and I think that we need to we need to cope with the fact that there was a lot of information that was being said, not because people actually had doctor. I mean, he said I've talked to doctors and all this. I'm that's highly unlikely. So. But I, but I don't want to put it in a partisan context, and that's the difficulty. Because yeah, as soon as you did that, you'd start to immediately, you know, you, you'd have the normal red blue divide. But we got to grow up as a country and get yeah. serious about examining what happened. Why is it that we have twenty five percent of the world's fatalities? Why is it that our per capita death rate is so much lower? The other day, somebody tweeted out, you know. Number of COVID cases in New Zealand today, one. Number of cases of COVID in the vice president's office, five. And that's what we know of because they're yeah, clearly, they're you know, not telling us everything. Why, why did that happen? It sounds like it's a partisan thing. It's not partisan. We do, you don't learn unless you actually study. And so that would be what I would hope uh, our country is capable of doing. Like the 9-11 commission, I think, was a very helpful exercise. Mm -hmm whether we're capable of doing that kind of analysis now, I don't know. I think that's a, a good analogy to think with, but in you're sort of talking about Rush Limbaugh there and other purveyors of disinformation. That goes a step further, I think. I mean, you didn't use the word justice, but I will. I mean, it, it, there is an implication there that we need to think about information justice. I mean, that's kind of how, how the sort of uh, digital divide emerges from discussions around justice. Yeah. Shouldn't disinformation be part of that discussion as well? I'm wondering. I mean, here I'm speculating. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question, and I could argue it either way because, after all, I did <laughs> I did go to law school and practice for a few years. Um, but uh, what I would say is the most important thing is to get a true understanding. Mm -hmm. And if you start from the premise of justice, you start from the premise that there should be punishment. And if you do that, I think immediately the defense lawyers come in. And what I would like to see is something, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word truth and reconciliation, which is what South Africa did and other sure. countries have did. Chile did something about the Pinochet regime that I think was a very useful exercise. Um, but but I don't want to say it's the same thing because I actually think we need to do that in terms of racial justice Absolutely. in this country. Finally do what should have been done in the 1870s in a way was done with the constitutional amendments, which the then Supreme Court essentially overturned. Yeah. Uh, in their own version of um, judicial activism that conservatives team, tend to forget. Um, but, I, but for, for me, the most important thing is not that Rush Limbaugh be punished, but that the country have an understanding of the nature of what he said and the impact. And it's not, it wasn't just him. It was yeah. not just him. Sure. Uh, there were lots of people. And I'm also not talking about where in the early days there was a debate about whether the degree to which masks can help or not. But after a while... There was it was pretty clear. Yeah. Um, Just a reminder: we're talking to Blair Levin on COVID calls. We're almost up on time, but I, I do want to get one more quick question in, if you if you don't mind, and it's it's the one you're expecting, which is we're less than a week away from an election here. Yeah. Um, so who's going to win? No, I'm not going to ask you that, but I am going <laughs> to ask you um, your advice to an incoming administration or to a continuing administration 
or if you don't want to give advice, what do you what do you expect to see as a result of this of this election? Um, even if the administration carries on, there's going to be course correction in a number of areas. One hopes, um, and certainly the digital divide will be one of them. What do you What are your thoughts on that? So, what I would advise uh, a next administration would be that, as to technology policy, the single most important thing is to have an agenda that reflects the need for digital equity and inclusion. And by that, I mean the same things I meant with the National Broadband Plan, but um, uh, with, a, with a lot more background uh, and, 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 and a lot more data, which is we, got, we need to finish the job of getting networks everywhere. We have a really big task of getting everybody on. And that's probably the most difficult and most important thing that we need to do. And then we need to really think about how we deliver education in this country, how we really deliver healthcare, and how these technologies can improve that, and how we how we deliver workforce training. I think this is one of the most important things. You know, kids growing up today are not going to have one job; they're going to have multiple jobs, and they're going to have to constantly be retraining. We can't do that by sending them off uh, to colleges or training schools. We can do it. The, the great thing about the internet is the way it scales. So we really need to make this a tool for greater equity and inclusion in society and in the economy. It's a doable thing, but it's not doable unless you understand the problem, you focus on the problem, you ask the right questions, you get the right facts, and then you come up with policies that reflects that investigation. Blair Levin, I hope we hear a lot more from you in the coming months. And thank you so much for your time today on COVID Calls. Thank I you really very learned much. a lot in the discussion. Just a reminder, you've been listening to COVID Calls and you can catch us every weekday and 5 p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow, we're gonna to have a researchers round table. So stay tuned for that. We're gonna have early career researchers talking about their COVID research um, from anthropology to sociology to civil engineering. It's gonna be a really interesting discussion and we'll see you then. Stay healthy, everybody. See you tomorrow, five o'clock. Bye-bye.